You know, uh, I'd, it's, a, it's a wonderful, intimate group. Why don't you all swing around over here? And, because uh, I'm going to start, start with uh, uh, this work by Keen Holtz. And um, just to give you a broad lay of the land, um, um, let me just start by saying uh, Onash, collection is, 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 is a legendary collection. I had the great fortune uh, 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 to borrow important works by Rauschenberg, which is over in the other, the other building, one of the combines that was in uh, uh, his, retro, his combine retrospective. Uh, George Brecht, uh, Dieter Roth, uh, and of course, Ed Keenholz. And although I first encountered uh, Onash as a, as a young man having just come back from my high school traveling around Europe and visiting uh, um, uh, the Venice Biennale where Gerhard Richter showed these, these, what I thought of at that time, oh, some kind of photorealism of all of these 49 leaders of Germany. And I thought, well, that was about as chilly a thing as I'd ever seen. You walk into that fascist building, and I thought, this guy's not like the other photorealists. And then Onash does a show a year later, 73, in New York. And it was, um, well, it wasn't a good time to open a gallery in New York. And, uh, 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 but it was an amazing, amazing introduction. And, and in a way, Onash bringing, you know, R R Richter to New York is a lot like bringing Ed Keenholz to Berlin. And in fact, uh, I, I, I knew how important Onash was in artists' lives. Uh, not only, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I was sort of curious with Clifford Still, there's a hundred Clifford Still paintings that were sold in his lifetime, 10 of which Onash owned. And that's a kind of a deep commitment. But this guy, who was as tough, uh, irascible, uh, uh, showman, uh, gallerist, critic, artist, and uh, you know, he moved to Berlin to be with Onash. Now, the myth of of of, of Keenholz is, uh, and there is there is, of course, truth to all myths. Is he leaves Los Angeles, leaves California, his beloved state. Uh, because of the war in Vietnam, and in fact, this you know this this memorial that he did to 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 the uh, sort of taking Iwo Jima up to Vietnam and his absolute uh, sort of brokenhearted that his country could be doing this in Indochina, no doubt uh, drove him, but it drove him to the hands of this collector Onash who has in this group of works here a remarkable early, early collection of uh, Keenholz. You know, Keenholz is a, a figure that um, um, when I first sort of conceived of this, all the work over here, I'm thinking about, you know, Rauschenberg, I'm really thinking about Kurt Schwitters and the kind of legacy of Kurt Schwitters. And if you look around, the <laughs> Her, her uh, homage to this giant who in maybe in many ways was reconstructed by a subsequent generation of artists. He had all been bit forgotten and it took people like Rauschenberg on the East Coast and Keenholz on the West Coast to create a, cli a climate which all of a sudden made Schwitter's experiments, these uh, immersive environments, the Mertzbau, something sort of meaningful. So I thought sort of surrounding and, 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 and creating a kind of cloak in which these works made, made a great deal of sense. And mind you, Keenholz, um, a little bit like uh, Clifford, still a West Coast artist who was very keenly aware of what was going on in terms of international tendencies, but also had a very strong, and I should say a profound sense of his own community, his own region. And um, uh, to that end, uh, while he had started in the mid-50s with a series of paintings, which you can say owe oh, a certain kind of debt, and they do, to abstract expressionism, to gestural abstraction. 
He very subtly referred to these as the broom paintings. And just so you wouldn't be at all confused that they were, in fact, painted with a broom, uh, I mean, it's like, oh, you think Klein's a badass? Let, let me get my broom out and start painting these. Is he would actually take the broom in some case and actually just leave it right into the composition. So he was, in a way, struggling with the same issues of sort of painting into sculpture. Where do you go with Klein, de Kooning, gestural kind of painting? And he's beginning to increasingly move out into something which certainly occupied him throughout his whole life. And that is a profound sense of, uh, of the injustice in American culture, political culture. It's not something, you know, that's sort of easy to, to fully understand. It comes at a time when America was at its sup supreme power in terms of the post-war era. He's growing up in the 50s. But he, like other artists, is really kind of already exploring what, what is, what's the fallout of the atomic bomb? What's the fallout of a world war that, in fact, could destroy all mankind? And there was a sense on his part that uh, the United States had both an opportunity and, in fact, the lack of a kind of certain moral fiber to do what it should do as a great power. And it's something that you see throughout his entire career, and it made him a person of um, a, a real lightning rod. He was an activist in that respect, and that uh, 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 communicated into the creative world. Uh, long before he became known for his assemblages, and in fact, was quite successful in, in terms of, uh, I'll get to that in a minute, in terms of uh, uh, getting recognition, he had decided uh, just a few years after doing those broom pictures to open a gallery. And so he opens the legendary Ferris Gallery. Now look at the history of the Ferris Gallery. is long and convoluted, and in some ways it's been owned by Irving Blum, as well it should be. But its foundations was far more of an underground, and it was Walter Harps and Keenholz who in the late 50s, 57, opened this gallery, which is first and foremost a place for California artists, Los Angeles artists, to be seen not provincially, but within the context of, in a sense, the most interesting, cutting edge, avant-garde, and yes, they still did believe in an avant-garde of that time and that moment. Now, mind you, he was actually rather sort of democratic and not wanting to have the whole gallery really be the Keenholz gallery. And he showed people like Ken Price early on and Billy Al Bankston and Robert Irwin, who was also doing abstract paintings at that, that time, very sort of painterly. But he did set up his studio right at the back of the gallery. I mention that because it's, you know, it was like, okay, you go see the Ferris Gallery, and there's Ed Keenholz, a little bit like you know, the store by uh, o Oldenburg some years later, and this idea of, you know, it's sort of like, ah, oh, let's, just, let's just cut the middleman right out of the whole picture, and let's go straight from, uh, from uh, the fabrication in his studio sort of out into the gallery. In his case, it was really a gallery to create a climate which would be supportive of Los Angeles artists. He even did things like in, in downtown, in central Los Angeles, there's a very famous sort of Barnsdale uh, 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 exhibition center. And uh, uh, on the grounds, he organized you know, booths with inviting all the new and upcoming galleries and some of the more older and distinguished galleries that handled European painting. And, and it was, by all accounts, quite sort of successful. So he was somebody who was very outgoing, very much reaching out into the community. And it seemed very special, not only in what he did, in a sense, in Los Angeles at that time, but for here, at this place, Hauser and Wirth on Piccadilly. Now, when I first came here, I think like many of you, it was, you know, to see young, artists like Jason Rhodes, an artist who had really 
been rather, uh, I think, neglected or overlooked at that time, Paul McCarthy. And it is without question the legacy of Keenholz is Paul McCarthy and Jason Rhodes. So it's a wonderful kind of continuity between the history of uh, this, these artists, this gallery. As a matter of fact, I remember when I was first trying to get an early uh, Paul McCarthy, uh, this masterpiece, the trunk, into Mocha's collection, and I was showing all the sort of props and tableaus and things, and somebody who'd been around for many years goes, well, gee, it's just like a really dirty Ed Keenholz. And so, you know, it, 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 is, it is part of that kind of sort of legacy. Keenholz kind of pulled no punches. And this work, which I'll start with, and I don't, I, I have a cheat sheet because the titles are really great, and I cannot get them right, is called The Big Eye. Homage to HS. Well, HS is Henry Sellis, who was a very well known, curmudgeon y, not very supportive critic for the leading paper, the Herald at that time in Los Angeles. And it's a review of the previous show that Keen Holtz had had. And he goes, Another tired try by smash toy school, i.e., that artist. And he goes on, not only to sort of really insult him, but misspell the names of all the other artists associated with assemblage, and to just kind of rank him down. So on this TV set, and mind you, this is America circa 1961. You know, this, this, is, this is a cultural icon. We're all sitting around the TV. He creates this kind of American tableau. Uh, this star relates to the uh, American Playhouse, which was something everybody watched on TV. It was, you know, the most celebrated sort of upscale uh, television. Behind it is Cyrano de Bergerac's uh, um, litany of uh, how to insult people, which is obviously a guide for how to dr deal with critics. And, um, and just so you don't miss, capture the, the kind of, uh, the moment, the time, you know, the, the cigarette butt, um, you know, it still looks like it's burning all these years later. It still has a little bit of sort of sparkle to it. He got so pissed off at Seldes that the galleries that he was affiliated with at that time, 61, uh, which included both Virginia Dwan and the Ferris Gallery, which he had left, and one other, none of them were allowed to show Keenholz, if they let this critic into the place, which I thought was um, something um, you just can't get away with to these days. Not to be, you know, you know, let anyone off the hook, for his first museum show at the, quote, legendary, and it was the legendary Pasadena Art Museum, where Duchamp, Johns, Lichtenstein, Warhol, all had their first exhibitions. I mean, this is the first exhibition of the common object. Uh, Walter Hopps, who had been working with him as a gallerist, gets to organize a show of uh, Keenholz's, well, early work, these tableaus. It's just 1962, 63. And one of the centerpieces of that, or should I say, one of the most controversial pieces in that exhibition, the one that Tom Levitt, a very good, nice, supportive museum director, had a little bit of worries about showing, was this uh, uh, indictment of the bad cop. And the bad cop, and his name is on there, is quite clearly, uh, he's, he would have been all but uh, forgotten, no doubt, Lieutenant Carter, um, he was a cop, who had, um, uh, on uh, more than one occasion, uh, sort of unlawfully killed people. And Los Angeles had, and for a long time, among the most uh, um, regressive, uh, racist uh, 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 police forces. And uh, Lieutenant Carter, who should have been thrown into jail and electrocuted, was somehow 
let off. And so he makes it quite clear um, he has tarred and feathered this uh, device for his execution. And on the top, just so nobody would miss, this phallic form is uh, covered with a photograph of uh, the Lieutenant Carter. And uh, um, the weird thing, and the kind of the beautiful thing about Los Angeles, is like you can do something that's a total provocation. And it, it's a, such a community of disconnected people that nobody ever got arrested or thrown into jail or nothing really happened. It just sort of came and it went, like you know, many, many of things. His interest in, 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 in sort of social statements, and, 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 and this is kind of one of the most sort of obvious in this collage, and it is called The Future as an Afterthought. Now, mind you, he's having children at this time in his life, and this was his, his mushroom cloud. And he was simply creating, uh, 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 out of these found objects, uh, something uh, that shows all of these, these children, the future, going up in a, in a, in a cloud of smoke. And, uh, uh, and it, is, it, is, it is as kind of narrative and sort of as simple as, as that. Um, Keenholz, like other artists who had emerged in the 50s, was associated, and the same thing was said about Johns and Rauschenberg in New York, it was called the Neo-Dada movement, and, and, and that was actually a good descriptive term. We've kind of forgotten about it, but when you look at all of these works, you realize um, it, beyond its uh, 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 change of both location, and sort of scale, and, um, and, and, and we'll get to sort of Hollywood in a second. Um, they are really works that use a lot of the same sort of kind of tropes of surrealism. The found object, displaced issues of scale, things that you see one being one way turned around and, 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 and turned into something else. And sort of vanity and narcissism it wasn't something that was invented in Hollywood, although this, this work, this window, is very much a kind of you know, response to Hollywood and sort of seeing yourself in the kind of sort of seesaw, but it's also the kinds of things that you would have seen by artists working in the 20s um, um, throughout uh, Europe in terms of a certain kind of uh, subject matter. This, this work, you know, the great thing about the history of art is um, these objects somehow live on and whatever, by, whatever way we understand, look at, and appreciate something in terms of way it, when it was first made, it also changes and, and, and evolves. And I'd never seen this piece before. It's not the most famous piece. It's just a series of kind of found objects that has a kind of... Um, almost caricature-ish type quality to it. And when I looked at it, and mind you, yet another Los Angeles artist that I have to mention, it's again, if, if Paul McCarthy and Jason Rhodes do, and, and are part of the heritage of Keenholz, so is David Hammonds. And David Hammonds was a Los Angeles artist. He grew up in LA during this period. He would have seen Keenholz and this kind of simple found form and this is the, the, uh, uh, the, I guess, the grand Pubas hat, past potentat of Kobar, and uh, uh, these objects is to me something that uh, when you look at, you know, uh, uh, something that uh, uh, David does in terms of these found objects and a kind of political content and identity politics, it's something that's quite, quite I think, um, uh, helps to in, inform his, his work and his development. And in this case, I don't you know, the, the title of it is, um, is called The Carnivore. But I, I sort of renamed it. To me, it's, it's a little bit like the most classical work in, in, in the whole group. And it's, you know, it's, uh, it's Titian, it's Madame Recamier, it's a, it's a reclining nude. And no doubt it is a, some kind of brutal representation of women of a woman, um, she, you see her genitals, uh, you see her sitting up on the, uh, uh, 
uh, on this uh, uh, reclining um, a foot iron. Uh, the light bulb's not on, but uh, you know, kind of her head is, is literally e illuminated. And he has taken a very kind of uh, classical sculpture, uh, taken bits and fragments of, uh, of a sort of tile. It's sort of blood splattered and dripped and bound and put back together. And um, it is uh, um, um, Keenholz's uh, uh, reclining nude. Um, these are two works that I had never seen before. And when I looked at this, I just have to say, I was just kind of blown away with a kind of charm. And it made me think a little bit of uh, Twombly and some of the sculptures that he had made in the, sev in the 50s, his very earliest work, these very sort of delicate things, um, this sort of rolled out bag and kind of a remnant of a performance, uh, blood splattered, clearly roadkill. You know, I was thinking of sort of boys and, uh, and how Keenholz had this incredible kind of touch and sensibility to make this, uh, this work, which uh, um, is called A Star is Birthed. And, um, um, you know, this sort of wonderful irony of, uh, of uh, <laughs> you know, roadkill and, uh, and uh, procreation. And then this is a portrait um, that he did, uh, Rip Van uh, Stender. Um, and um, it is, um, uh, you know, a, again, a very sort of simple uh, 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 combination of both found uh, forms put together. Uh, I suspect um, that this piece of concrete was something he both found and then began to sort of insert things into, pile them up, and turn this into some kind of little sort of human uh, 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 representation. The time he was doing this work, he was doing something that was also until quite recently in the Onash collection, and that's called the Roxy. And um, Roxy's been cleaned up recently, and it was uh, shown in Venice at uh, um, the Delgano. And um, it, it looked a, almost a little too clean, but it was fantastic to be able to see it from all angles. However, when the Roxy was first made, and it opened in 1962, so exactly the same time as these pieces, it was a walk-in environment recreating a whorehouse from Nevada, a legal, you know, a, a, le a legal place for prostitution in Nevada. And the representation of this, the grotesque, I mean, it, it, it is certainly, you know, neo-Dada, but it's also like George Gross and German Expressionism, and it is such a kind of caustic and painful and, and absolutely over-the-top theatrical production. Now, mind you, Rauschenberg really had just been doing the combines for five, six years. They were, for the, as outrageous as they seemed, and they weren't very easy to sell, unlike the Johnses, which sort of flew out of the Leo Castelli uh, gallery. The Rauschenberg combines didn't do well at all for the first the first two shows. It wasn't actually until the Combines were shown by Ileana Sonnenbend in Paris and then ultimately in Italy in the Venice Biennale that they became quite the celebrities they did. Uh, doing this kind of work, which was out of sort of found materials, junks and leftover and things that had uh, uh, expressions that were um, heart-wrenching, uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't easy material. But it was kind of history material, too. And in that case, uh, Rauschenberg would look at the history of painting, his own history. And uh, uh, he used many of the, 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 the you know, triptychs, used many of the devices that grounded them more in a kind of historical context. Ed Keenholz, the, the outgoing sort of snake oil salesman, art dealer, promoter, man of the people, not you know, going, going to New York for a few days at a time. What does he start doing but making absolutely walk-in immersive environments that are straight out of a kind of Hollywood horror set? 
well, nothing could have been more kind of extreme than, oh my God, you're making these sculptures that really look like they're, you know, they're, they're, they're made for, uh, for, for movies, you know? You've, you're Hollywood. You're, you're not a serious artist dealing with, you know, serious art historical subjects. You're dealing with political sort of uh, information and you're doing it and, and using the devices, the tableaus of, uh, of Hollywood. And it made him an extraordinarily both controversial figure and a figure that really, in fact, inspired, uh, uh, um, as I've said, a whole generation. By 1963, so it's really just three years after, uh, after uh, uh, he begins the first of his uh, assemblages. His work is among uh, the most prominently included in uh, 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 William Seitz's assemblage show at the Museum of Modern Art. Now the Museum of Modern Art should get a little more credit than it gets in that even way back then, it was trying to do and did some very cutting edge exhibitions that were defining a new period. In the case of William Seitz, he did both exhibitions of assemblage and op art. And he pretty much shut down those things for everybody. I mean, it was like, it was like, oh, the big museum exhibition came too early and everyone went, oh, okay, we've seen that, done that, and then sort of moved on to the next thing. And in some ways, those two areas, both op and, and assemblage, are something that's taken years to really be kind of reappreciated. And I think op art is sort of due for a, a, a reappraisal, a reappraisal now. But in the case of Keenholz, he was already well known enough that he was beginning to show in Europe. And it was Europe, and in fact, something that kind of sort of swings back to uh, Los Angeles and uh, uh, the history of, uh, of MoCA in its early days. And that's, uh, uh, it was Pontus Holton's sort of tableau exhibition of, uh, I think, 1970, some years later, in which Keenholz was really seen as uh, one of the most significant artists working in this idea of walk-in and immersive tableaus. And it was in that exhibition uh, that I think Onash first really became acquainted with the work and became um, his most uh, significant uh, um, collector. Just so it doesn't seem as if it's the thing that sculpture, as they say, is the thing you back into when you're looking at paintings, or in this case, looking at Keenholz. Um, this is another work of a, um, um, you know, this kind of is the house that Kurt Schwitter, so has nothing to do with this. This is uh, Brancusi. Uh, but this is kind of the house that Kurt Schwitter is built in. And um, it's funny, because when I started working on this, I was going to have this wonderful uh, uh, combine painting in this room, but the um, Hannah Darbovin uh, was thought to be small enough to fit where the Richard Tuttle is up there. And um, I love the fact that it grew to a level that was both uh, monumental enough to represent her importance, but uh, the, the truly monumental importance also of, uh, of Kurt Schwitter's. And it's, uh, I think it's inconceivable whether it's, uh, you talk about Johns or Rauschenberg or Keenholz, uh, that it could have uh, uh, happened without uh, Schwitter's, uh, um, in a way, permission and, and rediscovery. Um, and in this case, um, uh, uh, the Los Angeles artist, Los Angeles, the Bay Area artist, uh, Mark Suvero, um, created um, his own sort of uh, 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 wonderful uh, homage uh, to, in a way, the power of, uh, of an artist. Uh, for those of you who uh, are familiar with Mark, um, much of his monumental sculpture, and there's a, an extraordinary uh, installation in uh, San Francisco out in one of the fields, they always have elements where you can sit on, swing on, participate in. And he's somebody who, you know, early on um, uh, suffered a great tragedy, a tragedy, debilitating tragedy, and I think in some ways he's, he's, he's been wheelchair bound, but you know, he climbs all over things and he takes that kind of energy and freedom. And in here, 
in a homage to uh, uh, Brancusi, um, he's created a, a chair uh, for uh, a, a, a sculptural royalty, uh, both Brancusi and himself. And it's a way of uh, spring loaded and catapulting himself into a, another, into another uh, world. It was only a few years later that uh, all of his work, in some ways, uh, 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 coming out of, out of David Smith and the Cubi series really became all cast uh, uh, um, welded uh, steel uh, but at this time he was using a lot of found elements and objects and, and was inspired by uh, uh, things uh, in and around. It's pretty tight up there but you want to give it a shot if anyone wants to come upstairs and see a few little things. Um, first one up gets there. I, I, don't, I don't think the whole group can go, but it would be my pleasure to uh, talk to you about the rest of it. You know, I couldn't help but sort of be inspired. It, it certainly made sense to me that all of this sort of, uh, sort of found material and handmade should be in this uh, beautiful Piccadilly facility. And, and, um, since, uh, in some ways, you always think about the context, whether Jason and Paul that I mentioned earlier, uh, um, but Diderot is so, so closely associated both with Hauser and Wirth, and uh, it seemed that, that here in the position, the place where the, where the banker's desk, uh, no doubt, went under this beautiful globe, which, which is illuminated, it seemed appropriate to have these little cast gnomes by uh, Nadine Rose, and it's uh, again a uh, kind of uh, you know, <coughs> popular culture and myth and process and life all broke together and, and uh, it is not unlike uh, the sort of the politics of, uh, of, uh, of that we've been talking about with Keenholz um, also inform uh, many of, uh, of these artists' work. Um, but I, I'd like to start actually with this work because of the direct impact uh, that this American artist, H.C. Westerman, who I don't think is very well known, in, 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 he's not that well known anywhere, but certainly not in Europe, um, but it's really a, a, an important influence um, on, uh, on Keenholz's early work. And he was, a, 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 in a sense, an American craftsman uh, and a myth maker. And, uh, uh, during World War II, um, a, a war that, as I said, sort of defined a, 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 this whole generation. Um, he was in the Merchant Marine, and uh, a boat went down, and um, I don't know if this is the famous story, but uh, he saw a lot of, uh, of uh, sharks eating uh, other Merchant Marines, and uh, he did hundreds, literally, of drawings of sort of sharks, and. Sharks then became art world personalities, and uh, boxes became coffins for uh, dealers. But this very early piece is so beautiful, so simple, uh, the title of which is the description of a, a boat uh, listing to port. And uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like a, a life that's going down, and it's, it hasn't sunk, and it's still, it's still there, but it's. Uh, it's just, it's just listing, you know, and the absolute sort of simplicity of this and going into its own case and, and being contained. And that idea of image and containment is something that was very much, I think, part of um, the language of assemblage and collage. And certainly the uh, American artist from Astoria, uh, New York, from Queens, um, um, very earliest, these very early works. Um, by the Fluxus artist George Brecht. Um, and this is a really remarkable collection of Brecht, who is uh, probably uh, uh, much more well known in Europe in, and in Germany uh, than he is in the United States, but still is very little known and is one of those key figures between object making and assemblage and its history as it moves into performative activities, which is what you see over there. But in this, this rather very special group, you really see his uh, development for something that uh, owes uh, a certain kind of debt in terms of his organization to artists like Cornell. 
you know, you can even look at the earlier painters like Gottlieb would put things inside of cases. And this was something very much part of their language. To these objects, which have uh, 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 less formal and more of a performative activity, where play and toys and uh, activities of, uh, of sort of children's things, and you'll see a beautiful Klaus Oldenburg over in the other building that also <coughs> plays with sort of with children's toys and history all rolled together. And then it moves into uh, these assemblages, um, which are sort of beautiful and scientific and, uh, and kind of an entire world um, brought down and miniaturized into these little domes. And it's, it is as, as if uh, you take the, uh, the, 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 the uh, boat in the bottle and you try to, you try to make a life and capture a life and so inside these, these uh, uh, sort of the rarefied vessel. Um, this, this work, which is kind of a legendary piece, um, and it's so special to have, and I'm so grateful to um, our colleagues for lending this. Uh, um, you know, this is uh, this is uh, the combination of uh, a parlor game, of sitting there drinking. You know, you're stacking up cards, and you see, you know, both how drunk you can get and how high you can make this pyramid. And so you have this uh, yet one more. Uh, reference to Brancusi and the others, and Oldenburg over in the other building, which is also Brancusi. And here you have the endless column and sort of the countdown of kind of bringing these all up. Um, obviously, it's gone a little higher than history will allow us to have all, all by itself. But one imagines that when it was made by Brecht at a moment, at maybe just for a, just a, just a little fleeting moment. This, this structure stood all by itself to this height, and uh, you know, it was it was his kind of homage uh, to this great uh, Romanian uh, sculptor. And then finally, um, these uh, wonderful objects that um, you know the, we're just now beginning to really understand the relationship between uh, performative <laughs> objects, relics. Uh, uh, things that in some ways people consider just sort of leftovers uh, to the fact that they really also both embody and uh, had meaning as sculptures because they were used, they, were, they, they, they had this kind of life and um, it's not just uh, people like uh, uh, recently like uh, Marina Abramovich who's done actually a, a rather extraordinary job bringing attention and giving value to performative activities, but in fact it helps to sort of inform a whole generation of performance object makers, of which uh, George Brecht was um, a, the real predecessor in a good decade before people like uh, Marina were laying objects down and doing her knife thing or, or the bow and arrow. Um, he was doing these, these more kind of quiet, more poetic, uh, but performative activities and that they've all, in a sense, are here is a testament to the importance, the value they had, uh, both to the artist and to Onash, the collector, as things that both, as I said, both represent and embody. Um, almost like, I don't want to get too kind of religious about it, but I, I done a, did a lot of research on this subject in the late 90s. And I would go visit artists who hadn't shown, in some cases, some of their performance objects and I would start asking about something from like 1957 and I pull out a picture and like the great thing about artists, the amazing thing is they go shuffling back and they go, oh you mean this? And it's like, yeah, I've been waiting for someone to come knocking on my door. I've been keeping this thing because in fact it is a work of art. And these these this collection, I think together in terms of Brett, Really presents a very, uh, a very deep and significant uh, um, um, understanding of this artist, who really is the same same generation as I said of Dieter Roth, of Joseph Boyce, of Nam Jun Pai, um, of Yoko Ono in terms of high red center. He sort of fluxes activities. Uh, the quote European neo Dada movement was something that uh, uh, maybe never had quite the value that the American neo Dada movement uh, did. Um, thank you all for coming, and um, I hope you will take
the time uh, to really look at and enjoy the other two parts of the Onash collection over um, uh, including uh, uh, the abstract expressionist, color field, uh, European and American pop, and uh, minimalist material. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, but um, I know I've gone on longer than intended. And if not, on the way out, it's such a small room, really hard to see. It's a fabulous, generous uh, collection of uh, Richard Tuttle's work that was made in the mid-1980s. And uh, Tuttle, an artist who emerged at the same time as other post-minimalist, process-oriented artists, by the time in, in the mid-80s, things that had initially been like the size of a wooden matchstick, I kid you not, had now grown into these rather more beautiful and delicate collages. And, and I didn't really understand Tuttle uh, or appreciate him so much. You know, sometimes when you meet an artist, uh, you kind of think, well, anybody could do that. And that's not a very satisfying <laughs> thing. But sometimes you meet an artist, and you meet this person, and you see the work, and you realize, oh, like nobody else could do that. That 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 person is absolutely inseparable from the things that they make and the things they do. And that to me always rings very powerfully. And in the case of Richard, who has the most beautiful hands, fingers in the world, and you can realize as he's talking sometimes, he's actually just making these these beautiful uh, uh, and tough looking uh, uh, sculptures sculptures that um, characterizes increasingly appreciated practice. So it's over there. Thank Bye. Thank you very much, Thank you very much for coming.